Alright guys, we're gonna start. Uh, so thank you for coming and on behalf of the Alec Quarry effort, I'm gonna speak about what we did the last uh, past two months. Um, so first, what was the intensive behind this uh, Alec Quarry effort? Uh, so today, what is the only way to create data and data or data sets?
to extract data out of it, to you know, analyze the data, but you don't want to have to actually manage these files. You don't want, when you drop the hive table, that the data be dropped as well. You just want hive to be there as a tool. So to do that, you, you, you will create an external table that will point to those files. Uh, but that means that data storage, as I said, is not handled by Hive, and the table definition is just not is not managed by Hive. Uh, so, in addition to this external versus managed table, we have the notion of non-native versus native table. So, in a non-native table, Hive doesn't know how how to access data, how to write, uh, how to read and write to uh, the data files that it, that it deals with. So, to help him. Um, know how to manage this data, you have to give it what is called a storage handler. Um, and you have to, this storage handler has to be in a separate jar. And you pass this jar to the Hive box jars configuration that you give to Hive. So because Hive, uh, when it executes MapReduce jobs, uh, it will know how to talk to this data using this uh, external component. And so that it knows how to talk to this external component, you just put the jars in this uh, setting. This is how I got Right, so now I spoke briefly about storage handler. Let's see exactly what they mean, because this is how we will integrate later data sets with uh, Hive, actually. So a Hive storage handler is used to access data stored and managed by external systems. So a Hive uh, storage handler is actually just four classes. It's an input format, so a basic header input format that is used to Get splits out of the data that you want to that, that out of get splits sorry out of the tables uh, where your data sits uh, and also get the records out of those splits. So this is just an input format, uh, regular input format from the Hadoop uh, world. It also needs an output format which is used to write uh, if you're interested in writing data from Hive to uh, your external system, you can use an output format. You have to use a serdy, which is serializer, deserializer, to um, <coughs> get from object writable records to actual Java object records. And you have to give uh, to use an object inspector that will analyze the internal structure of your Java object um, so that Hive can access its, its uh, internal structure and get schema out of it. So far, data sets. We don't need output format because we're not interested in writing to datasets uh, for now. We only implemented those, uh, we have those three things, so a dataset input format, a dataset CD, and we actually we use the Hive Object Inspector uh, that provided by that. So now, let's see how um, we can go from these things that Hive provides, so a dataset storage handler, and how we, we, we use these components to uh, integrate with our data sets. So let me first explain this uh, diagram. Here at the bottom, you have the record scannable interface, which is the interface that your data set need to have to implement to actually be uh, queryable by Hive. So you, it contains three methods, get splits, create splits record scanner, and uh, get record type. In the middle, you have the Hive interfaces. Uh, so this is the classes that Hive will uh, call. This, this is actually the storage handler. Uh, and it will be used by Hive to know how to talk to data, how to you know, get the records, uh, get the splits out of the data. And here, this is just, uh, just the data objects that Hive manipulates. So once Remember, I, speak, I spoke before about Hive Server, right? Uh, so when a, query, uh, when a Hive client sends a query, it sends it to a Hive Server. So what the Hive, servers, what the Hive Server does, it will call the data set input format get splits method uh, to get the splits in our case of the data sets. And uh, in turn, this method will call internally the get splits method of, of the records kind of implementation. So this is here you could see why it's useful to implement those methods. Why, uh, so when you implement a record uh, scannable data set, where those methods are actually used by that. Um, so here we get the splits of the data sets. In so 
you have that split. And once you have that object, uh, Hive will pass the splits to multiple MapReduce jobs. Right? And uh, in those MapReduce jobs, Hive will instantiate a data set input format at the end and call the get record reader uh, method, which will basically uh, get, you know, get record out of your splits, like, like the name suggests. And this method will call the record scannable method create split record scanner. So again, you can see um, how our custom implementation uh, interface record scannable is called by Hive. So this is called in the MapReduce job by Hive uh, to get a record scanner. Um, so out of this, the, the output of this is an object writable uh, record. So to transform it into an object, uh, an actual Java object, you use the data survey, which will deserialize. So it will go from uh, object uh, writable to actual Java object. And this is how I will deal now with data set record. Now, when Hive has a data set record, it will want to um, analyze the internal structure of this record. So this is where uh, yeah. this is where Hive will call again the data set survey implementation get object inspector method. And this method will call the get record type of the record scannable. Uh, yeah, so here you have a flow of how um, Hive uses our custom record scannable uh, methods to uh, actually do the job. So let's speak now uh, of an example of a record scannable uh, data set to make things clearer maybe. So here we have the system data set key value table. So it could now implement record scannable as you can see. It could implement the three methods. Get record type, get splits, create splits record scanner. So get record type is just the you can pass anything to it, it's the, the actual schema of, uh, of your record, of your data set. So here we just pass key value, which is a 2 by arrays. Get splits will only de uh, get splits is actually common with a uh, batch readable interface. So here it will only, it's pretty standard in, in I mean we did the, the same thing before in batch readable. Get splits will only delegate to uh, the underlying table get the splits, it will pretty easy. And then, uh, since most data sets already implement batch readable, to create a split scanner, so what we want here is to have for one split, get record, all the records of the data set. And because in the batch readable interface you already have a, a method called create split reader, which from a, uh, based on one split will get key and value. If, if you give us that, we have utility methods that will transform a split reader into a record scanner. Right? So basically the create split reader will transform split into key and value. And if you give us a method to transform a key and value into a record, we can organize so that we get out a record scanner. Um, yeah, so this is a basic example. Mm. So now I talked about how to um, make record, how to integrate Hive with our data sets. Let's see how we actually start Hive in our architecture. So we created an explore module, and uh, the explore module is just an HTTP interface, an HTTP uh, service that wraps an explore service. I will talk more about that later, and a Hive service. So the NetHTTP service ex uh, exposes some public endpoints. You can send a query to this um, to this service. So the query is as uh, sending a query is actually asynchronous. You will get back a handler, and this handler can be used to get the status uh, of the of the query, get the schema of the results, get rid of the actual results, cancel the query, and close the query. Um, so before I talked about Hive Server two. And here we're not using Hive Server 2, we're using uh, CLI service. So what is that? Uh, actually Hive Server 2 internally uses uh, the CLI service. And Hive Server 2 is a synchronous thing. And it's actually harder to wrap Hive Server 2 in a long running transaction. So because we execute multiple MapReduce jobs, 
we want to we want to wrap the execution of a query into a long running transaction. And to do that in Hive Server 2, that wasn't easy. It's actually way easier in the Hive Server service because this service exposes some simple methods like same query and uh, actually the same methods as here. And wrapping a query around the execution of the uh, service is actually easier. And also, we tried in the past to use our Hive Server 2, but it only fully supports Thrift. So um, we can execute actually Thrift over HTTP uh, in Hive Server 2, but in that case, um, it won't, it won't uh, allow secure impersonation. So for, for this security reason, we can't really use Hive Server 2 in HTTP. And so this is why another reason why we use an ISO service. Alright, so the whole thing uh, runs, this explore executor runs in a control container. So this is because uh, the CLI service will use, remember, our dataset storage handler. And this dataset storage handler will call records and other methods, which are user code. And uh, we don't want to uh, execute user code in React Master for security reasons. So for that reason, and because if Someday we want to have multiple instances of the Explore executor. It's easier to run in 12 and yeah. So we have different implementation of this Explore service depending on the versions of Hive that, that we support. So we support uh, multiple versions of Hive. We support Hive uh, 12, Hive 13, uh, Hive that is distributed with CDH 4, 3, 2, 4, 7 and Hive distributed with uh, CDH file. So we support all these uh, Hive versions. And um, the Hive, those versions have different implementation of the CLI service. So that means that in turn we need different implementation of the Hive uh, Explore service. So, right. so now let's go in detail into the flow of starting the Explore module, which is a bit tricky. Uh, So first, there is a first step in React to Master Startup Script. We need to um, actually create an Explore class path, which will, which will contain all the Hive class uh, Hive jobs. Sorry. So I will explain later why we need a separate class path. Uh, once we are in React to Master, we are about to start the Explore Explore Executor container. So first, we need to check that the React to Explore enable setting is there. Is set to true. So if it's set to false, it means that Reactor doesn't need Explore, and then we just don't start the uh, Explore executor. And then if it's set to true, then we go to the next uh, step. The next step is to use the separate class path to create a separate class folder from, from the, the default one in Reactor Master to actually uh, try and load the Hive jars and see that they match the version of Hive that we support. So why do we use a separate class folder? This is because Hive and its JARS packages a lot of, uh, of dependencies that we use as well, like Guava and Protobuf, but it uses different versions than the one we use. And for that reason, if we use the same class path than, than Reactor, the same class loader than the default Reactor, the default Reactor Master class loader, we would have conflict because of those things. So we use it, we separate things, have a separate class loader for Hive, in the Reactor Master for that reason. Uh, so then we create an explore tool runnable container and we ship the Hive classes to this container. So this is because the assumption is that Hive only sits in the Reactor Master node and you can't assume that it's uh, present in all the nodes of the cluster and you can't assume that we don't know where exactly the container is going to be spawned and you can't assume that Hive will be there, so we need to ship the Hive jars uh, to the container. Uh, we also need to ship reactor related classes. So these are the classes that are needed by the data store, uh, dataset storage handler to talk to the datasets. So Hive will need to know how to talk to the datasets. And to do that, it will need some classes, like it will need the dataset framework class, it will need the dataset storage handler class, and HBase classes because uh, datasets are HBase native. 
So we also need to ship Hive configuration files as resources to the container uh, because Hive needs to know how to uh, connect to the system, for example. Uh, Hive needs Hive will spawn multiple MapReduce jobs, so it will need to know uh, what is the configuration of the yarn cluster. So we, we need to ship to this container the yarn site.xml configuration and also a Hive site.xml configuration containing some generic Hive configuration. Right, so now that we, have start, we started our explore runnable in a container, um, we need to next set the Hive works jar configuration. Uh, so that Hive knows, like I said, how to talk to the data set. This is uh, any, external, uh, any external Java classes that Hive needs need to be put in this configuration, Hive and jars. Uh, so we do that once we the continue. Um, the CLI service will connect to the existing Metastore. So this is because uh, Reactor doesn't start Hive. Hive is supposed to be installed in the cluster prior to Reactor. So we don't start our own Hive Metastore component. It's supposed to sit there. And uh, this is actually why we ship Hive configuration to the container, so that the CLI service knows exactly where is the Hive Metastore and how to connect to it. Uh, and finally, we just register the HTTP service of the Explore container to with the keeper so that router can route requests to, to Explore. So now let's see what happens when we deploy a dataset. So the overall architecture overview of, of uh, Reactor is that right? You have router, and then you have um, here you have the dataset manager, which actually sits in Reactor Master, and this is the Yarn cluster. Right? And um, here is our store executor um, container, tool container. You also have high meta store that sits somewhere outside of, in the cluster, but outside of the Yarn uh, cluster and which uses a database to store uh, information. We don't really care about that. So when you deploy a dataset, uh, dataset V2, the dataset manager will copy the definition of the dataset in the meta data store and will uh, put the dataset jar in the HDFS, right? So in addition to that, uh, when your dataset is record scannable, it will say, the dataset manager will send a Will, uh, call, uh, will ask Explore to enable this dataset. So what it does is just, in turn, Explore will uh, ask the CLI service to send the create table statement to Hive. So not much to say here. Hive CLI will talk to the meta store so that the meta store stores the definition of the, of the dataset table, and it will store also how to talk to the dataset. So the meta store will. will um, will store the dataset storage handler in just the string so that it can be used later. Right. Um, now, what happens when you want to execute a query? So like I said before, uh, Explore exposes several endpoints, HTTP endpoints. Um, to send a query, this is a, you, you have an endpoint send query where you send a query as a JSON. Router will uh, transfer this query to the export digital container. Uh, in turn, we want to wrap every query that, I, that is started, uh, we want to wrap them with a long running transaction because uh, Hive will start MapReduce jobs on data sets, and this is, you know, we want, we want those data sets to have access to the transaction, so we need to start the transaction. Um, so then what happens is, you send a query, Hive CLI will talk to the Hive Metastore to get metadata about the tables that the query concerns, right? And this is where Hive Metastore will, will tell Hive, Hive CLI, uh, you have to use this dataset storage handler to talk to the datasets, right? So this is where user code will be executed. Actually here, at this step, in return, um, Hive CLI will know that it has to use the dataset storage handler. And now it's going to call the getSpits method that, I, that we saw before to uh, get the spits of the dataset so that it can sp spawn the MapReduce jobs. Yeah. So it starts MapReduce jobs, 
uh, in the MapReduce jar, what happens is Hive uh, gives the same storage handler that is used, remember, to get records of, uh, of the data set and do work on the records and inspect those records and you know, actually execute the query. So what happens here is the storage handler will um, use the data set framework and data set manager to instantiate the data sets and get the records and do all the work that is needed. Um, right, so this is executing the query. And then since this is an async call, you actually need to call to get the results. So you will, you will uh, call the get results endpoint on the explore uh, executor service. And yeah, so the results will be stored by the high CLI service on the container in the temporary directory. We don't take care of this ourselves. Hive CLI does that for us. So we just uh, Hive CLI, when you send a query to Hive CLI, it will give you a handle. And this handle can be used to yeah, later get the results and get the status, get the schema. And that's it. Now, so we've seen pretty much how we integrate Hive with datasets, how we integrate Hive in our architecture. Um, the, the picture that is left is how to now connect a reactor to the outside world. So because we exposed um, public endpoints with Explore service, we can, have, we can now have a JDBC connector that eventually its goal is to open reactor datasets to external systems and BI tools so that external systems can use a separate JDBC jar to see reactor as a, data, as a database that contains uh, tables where the tables for us are actually datasets. Uh, so right now we don't have that full functionality, but uh, we can use the JDBC connector to uh, has out of queries and unit tests. So so far it's pretty much limited. Uh, here I just printed um, simple code of uh, JDBC, how to instantiate a JDBC connection, how to create a statement. I'm not going to go through this because this is pretty standard in the JDBC world. But just to say that we have a, now a JDBC driver that can be used like, like any other JDBC driver. All right, so we've covered much. Now let's talk about the troubles that we had along the way. We had uh, a bunch of class loading issues, which took us a long time, for a long time to debug. So main one, I would say, is the Hive, that Hive packages libraries with different versions. So like I said, in the jar, Hive jars, uh, the package libraries like Guava and Protobuf with different versions than the one we use. So at first, we tried not to use a... We, we didn't use a separate class loader at first, and this created lots of issues. We had to debug lots of things to understand what was happening exactly. But once we started using a separate class loader to prevent that, things went well, but you know, it took us a long time to figure out. Another thing is we had a bunch, a couple actually, of dataset class loading issues as well. So the dataset framework does not cache class loaders used to instantiate datasets in the same JDA. And this is, so in the, in the MapReduce job, uh, Hive calls uh, we instantiate twice uh, datasets. And because of this problem, datasets were instantiated using different class loaders. And Hive would just complain because the, the classes that we could get would not match because of that for some reason. Another data set really issue is that if you want to instantiate a system data set that requires user type, uh, well, this is not supported in our uh, explore container. Uh, the reason is, so for example, the example is the object store, right? The object store needs uh, as a generic type, which is a user type. And when you want to instantiate an object store, what the data set framework will do is it will see that it's an object store, a uh, data set, so it will, it will tell this is a system data set, but it doesn't have the user type jar associated to that. It will not load the user type jar, but we need this jar uh, in our explore module to have the, the instance of the data set. So because of that, there's a workaround around that, uh, around that. but this was an issue, right? Uh, yeah, a couple, 
a bunch of other issues. I, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, we had trouble with figuring out our hybrid configuration because there are two ways of reading configuration for Hive components. You can either read configuration from a Java HiveConf object or you can read configuration from a HiveSite.xml file. Thing is, in different um, components of Hive, so you have, for example, in the CLI service, you have a Hive um, a Metastore client, a MapReduce client, and in those components, we never know exactly where they will read the, the configuration. If it's from the XML file or from the object uh, Java object, uh, the workaround for, for that is that when you set a system property, this will always be given the highest priority, and this is how we set configuration using system properties uh, because we don't want to figure out oh this component is using Hive conf object and not the Hive side. Right. So we had a I'll have trouble debugging that as well. I'm not going to go through uh, all those things, uh, it's just a few. So, now what is left to be done uh, for the ad hoc effort? First, we need to finish this JDBC connector. We need to add more functionalities so that it can be fully integrated in BI tools, like I said, and so that BI analysts can actually use this JDBC uh, jar to to connect to Reactor in uh, existing BI tools. We need to support secure Hive. So for now, uh, we, only support, um, we only support perimeter security because Explore is, exposes HTTP interface and router, is, uh, um, router provides a perimeter security for that. We have that level of security, but if uh, Hive is actually secure and needs a delegation token, we don't yet support that. We need to support UDFs, which is, uh, for example, in a query when you want to, uh, you know, put select count of some uh, uh, some row or sum of some row. This is a, a function. Now we want to integrate user-defined functions, so we have to think about that. Also, a uh, problem that we have is that you can enable or disable Explorer right now in Reactor. Thing is, if you disable it and that you load dataset v2 that are record scannable and that later you enable explore, those datasets won't be picked up. We won't create hive tables on the fly for those datasets, so we should do that. Uh, we need to have a pretty, uh, pretty UI for submitting queries on the dashboard. Um, later, we want to be able to run hive on test. So, right now, like I said, Hive transforms a query into a series of map plots. Uh, the execution, execution engine can actually be test. Also, I saw that Hive has in its Jira pull uh, request to, to use Spark as the execution engine. So why not someday when we have Spark as a, in Reactor, why not use Spark on Hive? Right. That's it. Questions? So I've noticed that single node startup times, like on the IDE, is yes. a lot more first run explores than This is yeah. This is a uh, this one. This is one of the um, trouble that I didn't speak about. So right now we start a CLI service in any case, right? The CLI service doesn't start doesn't have a start and wait method. So we just wait for five seconds to. Uh, this is why you observe that. Uh, we need to find a way to to know when it's when things are starting. There's no easy way to do that now. So, so what happens if you don't wait? If you don't wait? We don't, we don't know. It might not have connected to the meta store yet. And if you send a query too fast, uh, it won't know how to talk to the meta store. Uh, so the first of all, it's not there. It can, it's a possibility. It's not only queries. Yeah, any interaction is uh, Yeah, so it doesn't have the initialization, so we don't know what happens if you static initialization. Oh, we don't know what happens if you send queries before that happens, it might have the object. We have we tried it out at this point, we'll find a session. 
So I also saw that I know Sharp, but there is a there is a Jira, a big Jira to integrate Spark and Hive. I think I'm not sure. Is it Sharp or Sparks? Mm -hmm. uh, you can, I think you already modified it how you set up. So can, I'm not quite sure how what your modification will take to how things work in Sharp. But have you had a chance to think about it, or is that something that you can consider in the future? It's in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know we have a bigger priority. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, everything is going to get prioritized. Yeah.